It's not acceptable. Like, I think pimps of any sort are, I truly believe they're amongst the most contemptible of people. I think there's nothing in, you know, the pimp is, I've got all these hoes and look at me like, you know, king of these women. And it's like, no, you are the ultimate in pathetic, parasitic predator. True. There's nothing about that that's heroic. True. It's just pathetic. True. Now, you might say, if you're that type, well, at least is, I'm not as contemptible as the cowards who hide behind me. It's like, fair enough. You know, there's, there's ranks of order even in hell. And there's lower and higher demons, you know, and... The person who would like to do something terrible but is too cowardly to do it, that's a pretty damn low form of demon. Mm. But that doesn't mean that the person who would like to do something and is courageous enough to do it, even though it's bad, isn't also a demon. Ooh, ain't, ain't f***ing men, Jordan. Okay, Jordan Peters. Me and Jordan Peterson agreeing. And I'm not just agreeing with him because I don't like Andrew Tate. This is literally what I would say I agree with full force across the board, right? Just because you're willing to do it and you make it sound cool doesn't mean it is, bro. I want to say this with a deep understanding that like human beings are nuanced and diverse and complicated and all of that jazz. And that everyone has something to offer us. And everyone is a human that like puts out dumb tweets, myself included, right? We just like get self-righteous and we put out a tweet. But this tweet does crack me up, okay? It's just, it's funny, right? It's like a funny idea. And it's not because it's wrong. It's that, well, it's not that it's like immoral. It's just that it's, it, it's not consistent. And so when I look at a person and I judge them, I'm judging in a multitude of layers, right? You're judging them kind of like, oh, that's interesting. Like I'm making a judgment. And then you might condemn to judge them. Right now, we're just making an observation like, oh, that's interesting. And Jordan Peterson was recently uh, kind of trending on my Twitter page because he had something to say about this satirical, you guys should see it on your screen, satirical blog that he didn't realize was, I guess, satirical. And there's something very funny about this. So you guys should see it on your screen. It says, Jordan Peterson said, everyone's a spoiled two-year-old. It's from the Wall Street Silver. It says, with the new dress code being relaxed at the U.S. Senate for Senator John Fetterman, other senators have decided to show their flair. Um, also with new outfits, Senator Cory Booker and Senator Kirsten Cinema. Cinema This week, okay, first of all, let's be real. Okay. If... This outfit, girl, if this red dress was, that's a look. That is a look if I've ever seen a look, right? But the thing that's kind of funny about it, the thing that makes me kind of giggle is like Peterson, one of the most fashionista of fashionistas, has the audacity to criticize someone's desire to dress uniquely. Sir, you are literally the king of drag. Well, not drag, but, you know, you're the king of wearing... Look at this. What are we talking about, sir? Look at this. What are we talking about? Right? That one's kind of fuzzy. But this man is literally known for wearing some of the craziest suits. And he has the audacity to complain that somebody wants to dress uniquely. Like, Why? And then I had to ask myself, like, what is it? What makes him put out the tweet? Everyone's a spoiled two-year-old. What is he trying to tell us? Like, what is he trying to convey to us? Because don't get me wrong, I think his suits are fire. So personally, I like Jordan Peterson's suits. I think they look pretty good. Like, I'm a fan. Like, I'm not complaining, right? Like, I'm not going to complain. I think they're cool. I think they look good. I think he looks so much better now that he's making money. <laughs> I have no problem with it. But what do you think it is that makes an adult who's so unorthodox in so many ways, first of all, fall for a satirical blog post, which I love. It's not even real. It's AI generated. These are not real photos. That doesn't even look like Senator Booker, in my opinion. Like, these aren't even real. I don't know who the blonde lady is. <sighs> but why, why would he care? But also, our... Our government officials wish they dressed with such flair. 
what is this, the Hunger Games? This literally looks like kind of like the Hunger Games, which kind of a vibe. But what do you think it is that makes him think, yeah, you know what I mean? Let's go. It's just, it's weird. It's a weird thing. But then I have to realize like, okay, humans are going to human and Peterson's so human, just like the rest of us, that there must be something in him. Like, again, if he was my dad, I would take away his phone. He's not allowed to tweet. I mean, I really wouldn't have the ability to control my dad. But like at the same time, what are you doing? But it's also like that self-righteousness that is so interesting to me. What makes Peterson feel so justified in having this sort of relationship with the people he sees as his quote unquote enemies on the internet or in the world? You know? That he too is a spoiled two-year-old? Maybe. Maybe he just doesn't like it. He's entitled to it. Yeah, but it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense for him to... It doesn't It doesn't make sense with... The, like, what is he saying? With the new dress code being relaxed at the U.S. Senate, which is a, it's not real. It's a meme. It's a satirical blog. Right? What does it mean for him... Is he saying that because he isn't an he isn't a government employee, he gets to dress cool and they don't? He thinks he has righteous indignation. That's true. That's true. Some people do behave like spoiled two-year-olds and he's one of those people. I wonder if he realizes it. I doubt it. That's the problem. Yes, he's not in political office, so maybe he feels entitled to dressing unorthodox. And if that's the case, that's fine. I can see the reasoning. Like I can I can see that bubble's reasoning for sure. I think my brain is more like, oh, uh, let's, you know, if it, if it looks good, it looks good. Let's, you know, let's be fashionable, I guess. Maybe I'm too gay for this, but I'm like, could you imagine though, if the politicians were actually going to work looking fire, like <laughs> there's something about that. Excited to watch your hair get bigger and bigger at this, as the stream progresses. Me too. Honestly, I have my pick ready to go. I had to jump into the shower and quickly like start the live show just because, like I said, we had that appointment yes or this morning and it was a, it was a lot. So, uh, <sighs> John Fetterman wearing a hoodie and shorts and office is based. Yeah, Fetterman looks so natural in a suit. I agree. There's something to be said about that. A lot of people don't like that um, Fetterman dresses in his sweats. They think it's not very professional, and I think there's something to that to an extent. Like there's something. Like here's him in a suit. Let me. There's something to him dressing um, kind of like he's such an ogre of a man. I love him. But it is – there's something about it that's so wholesome and normal. He looks like such a rocker, bro. This guy definitely listens to the Deftones. He definitely listens to Slipknot, okay? But, yeah, there's something so normal about him being in a hoodie. But maybe that's just for millennials because I know there's something also about a suit that makes people feel – um, more selfish, like more reassured that he knows what he's doing. So that's, for, I mean, signaling matters, looking good matters. I understand. I'm not trying to say, well, that's, I'm not trying to say that he looks professional in a hoodie. I would say that he doesn't look professional in a hoodie. I would say that he looks relaxed in this hoodie. I would say he looks casual in this hoodie. And there's something very endearing about that. But I wouldn't say he looks professional in the casual clothes. You know, but he looks so different in a suit. When he wears a suit, he looks like a different person. Somehow I'm like, who's that? And I'm like, oh, Fetterman, who's that? Who's that? Oh, Fetterman, who's that? Who's that? <laughs> like, it's so interesting. Man, what a tall man this man is. Like, I know so many people who look like this. And so it feels familiar to me. I don't know any almost anyone who wears a suit to work, you know? So it is kind of interesting, right? I think we just expect our politicians to wear suits, which is fair. It looks good. It looks professional. It looks grown up in a lot of ways, you know? So I get it. But Peterson does not look grown up in his suits. He does. He looks rich. Peterson looks wealthy in his suits, but he looks unorthodox. He's dressing in all these colors and all these flares, and I love it. I'm here for it. I just don't know why he wouldn't celebrate it in somebody else, I guess. Maybe he's jealous. It seems like he's gotten more bitter with those things he sees as being the left stream mainstream media. Totally. Oh my God. Yeah. 
His freedom is still within a box. He'll wear a jazzy suit, but he'll say, I'll, I'll still wear a suit. That's a good point. Yeah. I think he's made some profound points and arguments throughout his career, but the last couple of years, I think he's gotten lost in the sauce. For sure. I think everyone knows his maps of meaning is pretty good. He's so good at character observation. Maybe he's just jealous. I do think Peterson does suffer from jealousy. He's really afraid to lose. He's really afraid he won't be able to be himself. He's afraid he'll lose his status. He's afraid he'll lose the thing he's built. I think he does suffer from jealousy that other people might get something that he feels he's going to lose. And I also think he suffers from slight envy, but like a weird sense of envy. Mostly jealousy though, I think with Peterson. He might feel envious maybe of the freedom that he assumes people have who are on the left. I think everyone just thinks everyone's more free than them. I think the right thinks the left is more free and the left thinks the right's more free. Everyone just thinks everyone has better perks than the other person. The grass is always greener. And I think to some extent that could be true. Sure. Like, right? Everyone has an advantage and disadvantage in life. Everyone. So I, I think there's always this thought of, look what they get away with. Why can't I get away with it? And I was like, how about we reframe it as getting away with instead of we reframe it as like, things people do because of x -ray. Like there's a reason. It's not always getting away with things. How do we feel about the word spoiled? That's a great question. How do we feel about the wor word spoiled? What does it mean to be spoiled? I feel like spoiled is sort of a distortion of reality. When someone is spoiled, they're having a misunderstanding with bubbles outside of that bubble. But to be fair, if you're spoiled in a bubble, I was just watching Graham Stephan talk about like rich and wealthy children who have you know nannies and have um ski trips and their parents spend twenty thousand dollars on them and they're like five years old and in graham said like oh my gosh are they just you know are they being put in a bubble that once it pops they're going to be really shocked about the world right because bubbles but the thing is is that these kids are spoiled but also their parents are keeping them at a standard of expectation for the really really wealthy so there's something to be said about that. Logan Paul, when he was visiting like the wealthy up in the mountains, I don't know where he was, the Alps, who knows? And he said that the town they were in was for really, really rich people. So our average, like their average fast food joint was like $50 a burger versus ours is what, eight to 12, right? In America, let's say $8 for an In-N-Out meal and $12 if you get like all the Carl's Jr. combinations, right? Theirs was 50 so you can see what normal is to them, what normal is to me, what normal is to you, right? Everyone's having a different reality, a relationship with the reality. But if you're a rich kid who's being built wealth and your parents have put money aside for you and you're going to get, you know, a million dollars by the time you retire, or even by the time you're 20 or 40 or 50 or whatever it is, just handed to you because your parents did that for you. He adopted, Peterson adopted the aesthetic of the Joker, which he kind of considers to be his role model. What? That's not true. There's no way that's true. That's insane. What is he, an edgy, edgy Reddit mod? What does he mean? That, that can't be true. I am Googling. The Joe Rogan experience. I just watched uh, uh, Joaquin Phoenix in Joker. Mm -hmm. Joaquin and Phoenix. He's, he's a very charismatic actor. And I was thinking, well, oh God, because he carried that whole movie on, on single-handedly. It's a dark, dark. He's the only person really in it. Dark movie, and it has to do with he resentment. This man in. who was forced to be nice by his mother, yeah. you know, who turns out to be absolutely crazy and abused him like mad when he was a kid. Mm -hmm. and, and then he becomes this role model for the dissemination of complete catastrophe into the entire society. It's a story of Cain in, in part. But Phoenix really carries that, and part of the reason that he does that is because he creates a compelling character who's sympathetic. Like, you can be sympathetic to him because he really did have a hard life, like, <laughs> yeah. really hard. But Phoenix is an extraordinarily charismatic person, partly because he's so unbelievably, he's masculine in his features and carved, but he's so graceful. Every single thing he does in the entire movie is a dance. Like, he's conscious of every single movement he makes, every turn of his... I literally, that movie gave me the chills i couldn't even finish it because i was like the dysfunction in this film i can't handle it i mean i should go back and finish it but i literally was like i hate everybody in this film the grossest like it was like the worst people on the planet being represented is he identifying with him his right head now is 
conscious. It's dance-like, and you can't take your eyes off it. And a lot of stellar performers had that ability to integrate, male performers had that ability to integrate that feminine grace into their masculine character. What? There's no way. We have another Jordan Peterson clip if you want. Oh, to. oh we do? Beautiful. Yeah. There's another bit of him on Joe Rogan. He was on there for four hours, so I mean, it's... Thank God Joe Rogan is standing up. What is four hours? We can't really know. Time is a construct. Time is a Time construct. is everything. Yeah. Didn't happen in the Columbine case. They it, knew it, it was wrong. No, no. No, no. What are you saying? No, no, they were doing it because it was wrong. Right. They but, didn't just I mean, know, but did, that's but different. Wrong right? is the wrong word then. No, no, it isn't. It's exactly right. They were out to do the maximal amount of harm I don't mean, in the minimal in, amount but, of time. But they but they felt it was the thing to do and they didn't think that it was there was something no, they thought that it they was, shouldn't do. No, no. No, no. What? No, no, no. It's because like it's it. like the Joker. <laughs> right, but they he burns did it. The money. They thought yeah. it was something they should do. No. But they did it. Oh yeah. my god, Joe Rogan. How can he not understand this? So they shot, thought it was something they should do. No. What are you saying? I'm saying Listen, they if decided they said if they want, but they wanted to do it. <laughs> yes. And they did it. So yes. it was something they should do. No. No. No, they did it because it was the worst thing they could think of. Right, which is what they should do because well, they wanted to do the worst thing they could do. Yes, they wanted to do. Yes, we can agree on that's that. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> you know what's amazing? God, that's so f funny. Okay, f I don't care anymore. That's so freaking funny, though. <laughs> I would have. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. It was like, who's on first? Literally. God, that's funny. Joe is too high. I just think like that's the problem when you're describing why a person is doing something. So when I say, why is Jordan Peterson upset? First of all, the satirical blog post, but why is he upset that people could be dressing unorthodox when he himself dresses unorthodox? It's, you know, the why for me is everything. Why are you doing it though? But why, 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 why? That's, I just think everything is answered by the why, but you can ask why a thousand times in a thousand layers. And so there's something to be said about um, Jordan's sort of, his, his, see, he understands, like he knows the Columbine shooters knew it was wrong and wanted to do something that was wrong versus a lot of people do things that they think society thinks is wrong, but they don't. And that's why they want to get away with it. And then on top of that, there's sort of this, I didn't even know it was wrong. I just thought it was what was expected of me, which is why when people do things, I want to know why they do them before and or, or even during when I'm casting judgment. It's like, but why'd you do it? Why'd you do it? Because the why will change how I judge you. I really think intent matters. Okay, let's watch this together. Speaking of Jordan Peterson and Michaela, who's looking fire, bro. <laughs> Michaela looking fire in this video bro let's watch this because i am interested um they're going to talk about andrew tate and you know that's kind of a subject that sometimes is avoided with the petersons so let's go ahead and watch this together can we talk about two things sure okay one um i've been getting fairly tortured on twitter about this andrew tate thing mm. are you okay with addressing that sure okay so I think first, before we get started, and I only want to talk about this once because I'm very bored of this, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, delve into this too much, but I think a bit of clarification on my end. In 2019, I was in Germany and Andrew Tate bought me tickets to fly to Romania to go discuss business and then to fly back to Canada. And the reason I went was because in 2019, when you Googled Andrew Tate, he came up as a millionaire kickboxer. He had ideas about a subscription platform for me and for you. That's crazy, bro. I did not know that, that he reached out to them to literally offer them a subscrip. Andrew Tate played the game better than all of us. Damn. I'm so, I'm so annoyed at how well he plays the game. How could he, what a good offer. If, could you imagine if they had taken that deal? 
Could you imagine if they had taken that deal? Andrew Tate played the game too well. Damn. And here I was thinking y'all wouldn't fall for the shtick, thinking no big deal, just don't, you know. And here he is swooping up, swoop Michaela. Imagine if they had taken that deal. And I think part of the way, because of how, how I grew up, I basically said yes to opportunities and I didn't see a reason to not go talk to a millionaire about how he made money. Mm -hmm. And I also got the benefit of a ticket home. Mm -hmm. And I was also already in Germany. Mm -hmm. So I didn't see a reason not to go. That's also probably partly because I used to say yes to any opportunity, which I also think is part of the reason why I'm successful now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, I went there. From my experience, I met Andrew and I- Yo, I love her nails. I love the whole vibe. Met, met his brother Tristan. They were very nice to me. Mm -hmm. Like they were nice to me. We had a fun time. They're, the reason that there's a rumor, there's a rumor online that we hooked up or we slept together or something. That didn't happen. I've told people that numerous times. Okay. It's not like I was a yeah, well, people 20 year old like girl like enamored. Versions online too. It's one of the things I've really seen that the troll I'm not saying they slept together, but didn't they have a relationship? Or are we saying they didn't even have a romantic relationship? Because honestly, I was kind of shocked she did in the first place. And I thought less of her. But then when Jordan, said, Jordan made it clear he doesn't like Tate, I was kind of surprised that McKaylee would have dated Tate. But honestly, I kind of believe she never even dated him now. Because it never made sense in the first place that she would date Tate. Ew. Like, why would she date Andrew Tate? Like, have you seen her husband? He's literally the opposite. All demons like to go after women on that front, right? And so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's really so vicious, it's like, nasty, it, it, backbiting behavior. And it doesn't matter what I say. Mm -hmm. He's dispelled it. doesn't matter. Um, oh. Anyway, I haven't really commented on the situation because when I went, they were nice to me. Like, I, I actually had a pretty good time. He drove me around in his Bugatti and we saw castles, which was a weird experience. I remember telling him, he was a very, very, very smart person. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember telling him, you kind of remind me of a human shark. I don't oh. know, mm -hmm. like, what? Oh, she knew. She was like, I know. I can feel it. Okay, I kind of believe this. Do you guys believe this? I believe it. Because, again, I thought it was so weird that they even had any kind of spark. Because I was like, that's not even the guy she's into. Oh, my God. This makes so much sense, though. And if Andrew Tate also dispelled the rumor... People on the internet, man, I really thought the rumor was that they dated. And when I saw the pictures of them together, I was like, oh, that's so weird. But honestly, I believe her that they didn't do anything. What it was, but I was like, you're it's interesting. I don't know if it's your eyes or something, but you kind of remind me of a human shark. Mm. That was it. And then I flew home. Mm -hmm. So that like, that's the story on my end. Now, mm -hmm. I wanted to address that because people have been bothering me on Twitter for like two years or three mm -hmm. years because of what? pictures of us uh, smoking cigars or having a vodka. I can't believe she didn't clear this up before. Right away, I would've been like, no, I did not do this. I did not do this. Wow, why did she wait so long? Or something, because I did. Mm -hmm. um, and it was fun. Mm -hmm. But that's it, that's the story on my end. Mm -hmm. Do you think you made any mistakes in, in oh. that venture? Well, I had no idea he was going to become like the most famous person in the entire world. Mm -hmm. um, would that have changed it? N I don't think so. Like from knowing what I knew at the time, I would have still gone. Um, from knowing more about the webcam stuff. And he told me about, so once I was there, he told me about the webcam stuff. What did he not, tell not, you? Not in detail. Okay. I can't remember okay, like okay. that well, but it, it was something like women who want mm. to do webcam stuff, like they already want to do it. Mm -hmm. I help them make way more money mm -hmm. and I take a percentage. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay. I didn't, I don't think, you know, I wasn't like, that seems like a wonderful business model. No, 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 seven. She left her husband then went to Romania. She divorced her first husband but got remarried to the love of her life, Jordan. Kind of weird, but she, she, um, she's with her, Second husband. The first marriage was going to end. They have a kid together, right? The first marriage. <laughs> Even Peterson was like, girl, spill. Yes, sir. He's like, tell me the tea. 
I feel like she has too much of a backbone to Andrew Tate's type, too masculine women for him. I agree. I agree with that, actually. I think that's the thing is that I I think I treasure my independence and my masculinity so much. Like when men are like, you're too masculine, what I hear is you have too much of a backbone. That's what I hear. Like when men tell me I'm too masculine, I just hear like, I'm not going to put up a bullshit. That's what I hear. So thank you. <laughs> but I was like, if there are women who are already doing it and now they're making more money, I guess it doesn't seem, you know, it is what it is, mm -hmm. kind of. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know that until I got there and then... He, he wanted to set up subscription platforms um, and said they could be very valuable. And, and we'd already been kind of looking into that because you'd had some issues with social media. I was worried you were going to get banned on sites. And so I was already thinking it would be good to set that up with a subscription Well, platform. Gmail canceled me at one point. Yeah, I know. That about that time. Yeah, it was ridiculous. So it was That's like it would be wild. good to learn how to do the subscription platform. Um, anyway, that... So I kind of went there to like scope things out. And it was a very interesting experience and they were nice to me. That's like the story. Yeah, well, the, it, I hesitate to talk about Andrew Tate because I don't know that much about him, you know. That, but I'll, I'll tell you what I know and what I think and people can take it for what it's worth. I mean, tell the us. first question is why is he so popular? And the answer is, well, if you have to choose between being depressed and anxious and laying downstairs and covering yourself with Cheeto dust and looking at pornography and being timid and never going out, or, you know, listening to someone like Andrew Tate who says, like, get the hell out there and take the world, like, that's better. That's the shadow, right, speaking in some ways, right? Like, if you're naive and timid and anxious and intimidated and useless and resentful, there's going to be a bit of a monster that needs to call to you to say you know, gird up your loins and get the hell out there in the world. And so it's better to be, it's better to be a monster than a rabbit in some ways, right? Or at least there's some utility in the more monstrous predatory path that isn't there in the pathetic rabbit path. And that's partly because if you are a pathetic rabbit, you're going to become a predator anyways. You're just going to become mm. a dark backdoor, backbiting, gossip mongering, resentful monster. Society is so, also pushing that on men. In yes, particular, constantly. Like, be well, and I knew, look, I knew, I knew, and I warned people repeatedly that if the culture kept emasculating men, that men who said, to hell with that, I'd rather be a monster, would become extremely popular. Again, what does it mean to emasculate men, right? Because again, everyone's going to be a certain level of masculine. Everyone is going to have a relationship with masculinity or femininity that's going to differ so much to, okay, Jordan, uh, sorry, uh, Andrew Tate fans don't think Jordan Peterson is very masculine because he cries all the time, Right. Peterson is more masculine than Michaela Peterson's current husband, Jordan. Okay. His name is Jordan. His name, his, her dad's name is Jordan. Okay. And then Jordan Peterson is more masculine than Tim Poole, but Tim Poole is more feminine than Sargon of Akkad, and Sargon of Akkad is more masculine than <sighs> Tim Poole. <laughs> I don't know. What is masculinity? What is femininity? Like, what does it mean, right? Jordan Peterson admits he's not masculine based on his own standards. Well, that's the dilemma. Which men, what is the value of masculinity in men if the masculinity is toxic? What is the value? Like, I think Russell Brand suffers from obviously like toxic masculinity, right? He demeans women. He calls them names. He uses names to like show power. He doesn't use names to be like loving or compassionate or sweet. He uses them to be like, Look here, sweetheart. He, like, does it to, like, demean. So, again, when we're saying, you know, we shouldn't emasculate men, I'm not sure that we're also not saying we shouldn't progress as a society. Because, again, in a more, I think, progressive society, when that's kind of evolved past the monkey brain, I don't know how masculinity plays a role in, in, in a heightened way, heightened masculinity. Masculinity is great. I feel like I like my masculinity. I like masculinity in people. It's not a requirement to have a heightened sense of masculinity for a functioning society that's so modern. So modern. Russell Brand also has very feminine mannerisms. Totally. I'd assume it's something like the 
demonization of aggression or something like that. You know, it's like, I appreciate the peacocking from men. They're like, I'm going to protect you. I'm so strong. I've got this. But again, what does it mean, sort of, to peacock in a world where you're never going to have to peacock or use that skill you're peacocking? It's like, my brother carries a gun on him every day because he's a cowboy and like I like that or like a city cowboy, I should say, city slicker. He's like a city slicker cowboy. He, you know, he's from the suburb. Everybody relax. But he lives on a farm now and he has like his animals and his wife and kids. He carries a gun on him and it's pretty common where he is. A lot of people have a gun on them and he wears it like a cowboy wears it out in the open. He wears it in a nice, like he has a nice cowboy clothes. He looks really good. He looks very non-threatening, very like just nice. And... Um, when, when is he ever going to need that? He's really going to need it against a bear or a cougar. He's not going to need it against a person. He doesn't live in a place that has a lot of shootings. Like where he lives, you're worried about wildlife. You're not worried about people. But the fantasy he gets to display is like, if anyone ever comes in this house, if anyone ever breaks in, but statistically he'll probably be okay, especially because of where he's moved his family. It's pretty safe. So it's one of those things where what does it mean to display masculinity in terms of protection when we're not living in a world where that's necessary to the same extent? Like, okay, the other day we were in bed and we heard like a sound, like a slamming, like a something fell. And I was like, oh my God, could somebody be in the house with a gun? And then he's like, you live in Europe. And I was like, oh, could somebody be in the house with a knife? And then I was like, I got like, who's going to go get up and see? And it was one of those things where like, our door is so bolted down. Our doors are so – there's not even doorknobs on the outside of our house. Like, you can't come in. Like, there's not a chance anyone's in this house. There's just no chance someone broke in. Just zero chance that there's, like, a lock on the door. Like, you can't come into my place. Like, it's so secure. We got this building for a reason. There's no way anyone's breaking in. It was the cat, by the way. Like, it was probably the cat. Like, she, I, we assumed she knocked something down because when we went to go check, nothing stood out to us. But it was one of those things where for him and I, like, we're, we're, we both have this similar chance of defending ourselves against this bad guy. It is what it is. Like, what do I need him to be hyper-masculine for, to peacock for a situation that probably not happen? Because we live in a place where that's just not the thing. On purpose. That's, that's also something where I understand intense masculinity or heightened masculinity might be needed in an area where it's demanded. But in a modern world with Uber and Uber Eats and just modern world, it's not as necessary. If you live in a safe enough place, it's not necessary. You think in the suburb, these men are really displaying like a lot of masculinity. So again, and I'm not just associating masculinity with like protection, but I'm just saying as an example, I just feel like it's a lot of promise for men. Men just want to peacock. And say things like, oh, yes, I'll protect you. Girl, we're going to call the cops. Please sit down. Like, please sit down. You know what I mean? I genuinely don't understand what people mean when they say men are emasculated. Like, how so, girl? Yeah, I feel like if someone can emasculate you, like I, I don't know what that means except somebody who's, like, emotionally abusing you. I don't know. I don't know what emasculation – I don't know. Is there only one scale of masculinity? Are there different ways to be masculine? For sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Was Prince masculine? Um, I think Prince was like very feminine presenting and masculine in his dominance. I would say his dominance didn't feel very feminine to me. It felt very masculine. But his presentation was very feminine. How do we uplift femininity though at the same time? Because it's also villainized. That's the problem is I don't think society has a good relationship with itself because people don't have good relationships with themselves. So I think this idea that society as a mob is going to encourage us to be healthier and better when they don't ever do that, I just, I'm not relying on it. I'm relying on having a good relationship with femininity and masculinity in my own life. I think you should do that too. I think you should have the relationship with femininity and masculinity with yourself and then figure out what world you're in. Some displays of masculinity in some cultures is slapping a woman on the ass who didn't like it. 
some displays of masculinity in some cultures is forcing a woman down so they know they're masculine. Is that not toxic masculinity? All these men that are afraid of the term toxic masculinity don't understand that in certain cultures, it is masculine to basically assault a woman or another man. So why aren't we having that conversation? And until people are willing to say that there's toxic femininity and toxic masculinity, I feel like we're not even having the real conversation. Like yesterday with the age gap relationships, I really want to have this conversation again. I really want to do another panel with different people maybe who want to sit down and have like a really long form discussion about it. Because again, there's so many reasons why an age gap relationship, again, we're not talking about people over 30 because honestly, at that point, you do you, you know what you're doing. Come on. But under 30, I think there's a lot of vulnerability that is happening. There are a lot of brain development that hasn't happened. And look, I don't know about you. I don't think 19 and 18 year olds and 20 year olds should be taking out student loans at 100K. I don't think it's ethical to assume these kids can make those choices. I don't think it's ethical for them to go to the military. I think it's fine for them to start their adulthood to some extent, right? In some ways, they can consent to certain things, obviously. But just like you turn 18 and can join the military, but you can't have a beer, it's like we play this game all the time with what we think people are able to consent to. I don't know why people are freaking out that an age gap relationships, an 18-year-old and a 55-year-old might be inappropriate or an 18-year-old and a 35-year-old might be inappropriate. You think it's inappropriate for a, a, an 18-year-old to have a beer, but you think it's appropriate for them to pick up a gun and go fight in Afghanistan. So like, don't even fuck with me, society, as if you care about what's happening to the youth. If you cared, you would ban them from being able to go into infantry at such a young age. You would ban them from dying for stupid political reasons. Anyways, <sighs> I think a lot of men, me included, were taught at a certain uh, taught a certain form of masculinity that was incomplete, leaving out the emotional maturity aspect. Ooh, fair. Fair. Do you believe the patriarchy is a problem? I think humans are a problem. And this thing called patriarchy is so deeply rooted in the ego of immature and insecure people that the patriarchy itself, no matter how you look at it, right? It neither helps everyone nor destroys everyone. I think there's a meaningful difference between joining the military at a young age and drinking alcohol in the U.S. at a young age. Yeah, I think there is a meaningful difference. I think you should be able to drink before you can go to the military. I think you should be able to have a beer if you can fight in the military. Or reverse it. 21 to join the military, 18 to drink a beer. Now, in Andrew Tate is emblematic of that in many ways, because the first thing you got to say about him is that he's genuinely tough, right? So that's not a front. That's not a front. That's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. He's a fighter. And, and th you can't take the courageous element of being a fighter away from that's someone true. who will actually step in the ring, right? And so now, and, and then... And to be fair, Andrew Tate is so annoyingly well-rounded, I hate it. I hate everything. He's intelligent. I like that he plays chess. I like that he's a fighter. He is well-rounded. He like holds a lot of femininity and masculinity, which is very frustrating. And he's good at the game he plays. He is indeed a top G. He's just so unethical. He's just so awful. And that's why I don't value his presence on earth because I do think he causes more harm than good. You said Tate's intelligent, and what that means as well is that some of the things he says are going to be of value. Now, why he says those, that's a whole different issue. The, the thing that disturbs me is that, like, I'm not very fond of the whole online... Oh, pause, Jeremy. Jeremy, you cannot think this is true. Jeremy, you are better than this. If you look at places like San Francisco, Baltimore, Chicago, and Seattle, the crime and lawlessness, that's the result of a lack of masculinity. Being soft and coddling doesn't make the world safe. Chicago and Baltimore lacks masculinity. Gang violence lacks masculinity. Sir. 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 What are you even talking about? You think the violence is, that is happening in these places isn't because of masculinity? 
maybe toxic masculinity, but you think femininity is breaking into stores? You think femininity is causing gangs? You think femininity, the sissification of the world is causing gang violence? Sir. Sir. Now, in San Francisco, okay, that is a government problem, okay? Gang violence is weak. Masculinity doesn't mean strength. Masculinity doesn't mean strength. Like, that's not what masculinity means. Like, it could mean, it could mean a version of strength, but femininity is also strong. F- masculinity is, like, not considered, str- like, what does that mean? Lack of masculinity in a male figure. Guys, what does masculinity mean to you? Do you think it means strength? Is the, Are they synonyms? Is that a bubble thing? I think that's a mistake to assume masculinity means strength. Unfortunately, some of the most well-rounded charismatic people are some of the most unethical. True. Girl boss, gay keep gang violence. Let's go. Masculinity equal dominance. I don't know if dominance is strength. Dominance can be strong, but it could also be toxic or healthy. So when you say masculinity means dominance, are you saying it's healthy or toxic? For a lot of people, it's another word for dominance. Mm, I think masculinity can be dominant. I think masculinity can also not need to display dominance. Masculinity is often outward projection displays of strength maybe. Mm, Interesting. That is not how I think of masculinity. I think people think of it as masculinity, social expectations of being a man. The term masculinity refers to the roles, behaviors, and attributes that are considered appropriate for boys and men in a given society. Masculinity is constructed and defined socially, historically, and politically rather than biologically driven. What is the meaning of masculinity? Masculinity displays attitudes and behaviors that signify and validate male- maleness and involves being recognized in a particular way by other men and women. What are the four types of masculinity? Uh, I'm not seeing it. Okay. Is masculinity synonym? Synonym. Uh, virality, manliness, vigor, strength. Okay. So it can be strength, ruggedness. I can see how it could display dominance, which could translate to strength. Again, it's a bubble thing maybe, but I don't necessarily associate masculinity with like a strong culture because masculinity also breeds violence and weakness in a lot of people if it's toxic. If you have a masculine man who beats his wife down three times a week to make sure to confirm in her that he is dominant, where's like he's strong physically, but where's the strength in character, right? Like where, what is the strength in character? What's masculinity for me? What I just read out. It's just like a group of behaviors and energy attributes that we define as masculinity. And it's usually um, like women can be masculine too. Yes, but I don't think masculine means good character. So when you say a lack of masculinity is why these these con- like these cities are lacking character, masculinity doesn't mean good character. Like it doesn't mean moral. It doesn't mean ethical. Like asserting dominance doesn't mean ethical. So again, when I say asserting dominance, like Hitler asserted dominance on the Jews. What are we talking about? Like, what does it mean to assert dominance? Default good. Why is it default good? So when people say, um, oh, I wish men were more masculine, you're attributing a value to masculinity that is a bubble or a cultural thing. And then feminists, maybe, are attributing a negative to masculinity that's probably undeserved or deserved based off the bubble, right? Masculinity and femininity are like attributes in a person, but not necessarily in relation to a character. I think ruggedness is actually the best synonym for masculinity. I'm okay with that. Ruggedness is a good one, but ruggedness doesn't mean anything. It doesn't tell you if you're good or bad. It doesn't tell you anything. Masculinity is nothing but an archetype. Femininity can be absolutely dominant, but in a different way. I agree with that as well, right? So again, I think when you say something like, oh, these places like San Francisco, it's just lacking masculinity and that's why it's going downhill. You're attributing so much to masculinity. You're you're moralizing it in a way that I can't even fathom. Because again, that's like saying, 
can't women say that? Oh, it just needs more femininity. It needs actually compassion and caring for and caregiving. It needs softness and compassion and therapy and like all the things that people associate with femininity. Yeah, I just don't think it defines character. That's why there's toxic and positive masculinity and femininity. You know what I mean? Think mean girl behavior. That's all about dominance. Yeah, and that's toxic dominance. That's toxic femininity, right? That's like the worst kind of femininity is like mean girl behavior. That's like a bad display of femininity and a bad display of dominance, right? I think masculinity like femininity has strengths but also has weaknesses. Neither is synonymous with strength or weakness. Yeah, I don't want to I don't want to assume that masculinity or femininity is inherently good or bad. I just feel like it's neutral. It is what it is. And then the character of the person exhibiting that or the animal exhibiting that makes the decision. A dominant dog could be great if it's protecting your kids or a dominant dog could be horrible if it's biting your kids, right? So I just don't want to associate femininity or dominance with good or bad. It feels so neutral, you know? Let's keep going. My important thing in any way and I don't think that it's okay for young women to monetize their sexual attractiveness online. I think that leads to a very dark place for them, even if they're successful, no. because becoming it hurts successful your, it hurts by- your soul. Yeah, by, you don't become successful by exploiting yourself. And you might think, well, I can exploit myself. It's like, you can't- I mean, I agree with this. I'm not sure that it's very dignified to exploit yourself, I think we're defining exploitation differently. And I think that's the problem is we're having a different relationship with that word. It's why when young girls do come to me or young boys come to me and say, hey, I'm 18. I want to start an OF. I always say like, okay, hold on. I'm sex positive. You can do you. I love that for you. Are you sure though? And I usually have like a slew of questions I can ask them. I can usually go through a list with them. And by the end of it, they're usually not ready. So I would like to say that I would also like young people and old people not to exploit themselves for money. Some people feel like in a capitalistic world, we default exploit ourselves. I don't think that's true. I think it can be true if you lack the tools, education, or privilege to kind of get out of those situations. But I don't think it's true across the board. And I don't think sex work across the board is exploitation. I think the relationship you with you with that you have with it can be exploitative or not. I think putting yourself on display like Jordan Peterson does in his nice tailored suits and his nice haircuts and the way Michaela is obviously putting herself on display, right? That's totally fine. They are they are making sure they are beyond presentable, right? Michaela doesn't have to have those fake nails or those lips or those earrings or the nice dress that goes all the way up her thigh. I would, if I dress like that in front of my parents, they would slap me across the face. P.S. My parents are so conservative, they would never let me wear that dress in front of them. Look how high it goes up her, like, her body. Hello, ma'am. Sexy. That's hot. That is sexy, okay? And I don't know what to say about that, except, like, yeah, good for you, girl. But, like, I don't think it's exploitative of her to be sexy. I don't think it's wrong for them to objectify themselves, right? I like the way they look. They look great. I think they're beautiful. And if they had an OnlyFans where she just dressed up in pretty dresses, cool right? That's kind of hot. She does it for Instagram. Why not do it for OF? If Michaela was smart, she'd have an OF, but she can't because it also would be bad because it would ruin her brand. Because the stigma of OF is that it's all sex workers, even though it's not. Just because that's the majority, right? So again, no judgment, but I really do think that what is exploitation, right? Especially under capitalism, what does that mean? Treat yourself like a psychopath would treat you and get away with it even if the psychopath that's doing that is yourself. That doesn't work. That's why psychopaths aren't very successful because they exploit themselves just like other people. And so I don't like the whole online porn thing. And then I don't now, my understanding, and, and I've watched him apparently agree to this characterization online, you know, it's hard to get a I'm not trying to be the jury here because I haven't heard the whole damn story, but from what I've watched is he would enter into relationships with women mm -hmm. and tilt them in the direction of generating like an OnlyFans following uh -huh. and monetize that and then take mm -hmm. a percentage. And there isn't anything about that that I think is acceptable. You know, and you could say, well, you know, women are the captains of their own soul and if they want to monetize their own attractiveness, then what... The I think that's really strange, though. 
I don't think even in sex worker bubbles, it is healthy for someone to date you so they can monetize your body. Think about that. If you have a mom or a dad who look at you and say, oh, I can monetize my child's body. And they put you in Hollywood and they put you in front of modeling agencies and they make you do things you're uncomfortable with and they make a money, they make their living off your body. I think that's super undignified and unethical. I think that is so unacceptable. If you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend who monetizes your body, who's basically only dating you to make money off of you, that's so unethical. It's why these drama tubers, when they're, you know, they overlap their real life with their performative life. And I think a lot of unnecessary toxicity and dysfunction and abuse is happening. I think it's so clear that these people don't always have bad intentions, but when you mix work in real life, it's difficult. You know, again, I understand the temptation to, well, I understand the healthy version of going into business with your partner. And I understand the unhealthy, dysfunctional uh, decision to date someone because you know they're going to make you money. And I want those things to be different. I think they should be different, right? I really do think they should be. Vlad says the dichotomy is that conservatives attribute toxic masculinity to the lack of positive masculine traits, but liberals attribute it to the lack of feminine traits. Mm. Yeah. Do you think adding toxic to the masculine or feminine traits is part of the problem? Can't toxic just be toxic? No. It is for me as a person who's obsessed with categorization, who thinks everything needs to be categorized and all of the uniqueness, just saying you're toxic is kind of meaningless after a while. Well, in what way are you toxic? How are you toxic? You know what I mean? It's it, For me, I would need to know what is the toxicity I'm displaying. Because if I don't have a name for it and I'm not specifying it, I don't really have a relationship with it. If you can't name the devil, do you know he's there? You have to be able to name your devil. You know, you wouldn't go to an addiction counseling and be like, oh, what are you addicted to? Addiction. I have an addiction. Stuff. They'd be like, well, what kind of addiction? Stuff. Well, how do we know where to put you in NA, AA? Like, how do we know? Uh, stuff. I'm addicted to stuff. You can say you're an addict, but it kind of matters which addict because you need to get specific help. So if you just say, oh, you're toxic. Okay. What does it mean? If you say I suffer from toxic masculinity. Okay. Now we got a category. Let's go ahead and see what we can do with that. And then within that category, there's going to be other categories. So I think it's very important that we specify which category we're tackling and why we're tackling it. I really think it's important. Bro, being in somewhat BDSM spaces has changed my views on submissiveness and dominance. The fact that some people can see sub-energy as inherently worse is mind-boggling. Literally. It's like, what? And by the way, even in dungeons, can I tell you about that age gap relationship conversation yesterday in the panel? Even at the dungeon, where it's, you know, it could be all age parties, which I'm all about. I've had older play partners, non-sexual play partners. I've had amazing interactions with people in their 50s and 60s, really skilled people. Again, I practice like non-sexual BDSM for the most part, depending on the partners I have, you know, usually traditionally, especially with platonic people, obviously. And some people were like, ew, why are these 50-year-olds into playing with you? But the truth is, is they have a skill set that these 20-year-olds don't have. So I want to I want to play with them because they can do needles safely. They can do rope bondage safely. They can do flogging in a specific way. Not that 20-year-olds can't, but there's a skill set here. These people have literally been doing it for years. So anyway, even in the dungeon, though, there's always that creeper. There's always the one out of 10 guys, one out of 10 women who prey on the new 18-year-old who comes into the dungeon. There's always those guys, and I don't like them. There's always the guys in their 40s and 50s who are like, <laughs> new blood. They're like, oh, is this girl 20? And I'm like, and they're gross. And the young girls feel it. The young girls feel it. They're like, bro, I feel you just picking me because I'm young. And I think there's something about that that is inappropriate. It's a deliberate decision to prey on someone who's young blood that you can train in a specific way. And usually those guys do eventually come out with some grooming allegations. Because it's weird. It's weird. And so even in dungeon spaces where these people are supposed to be aware of consent and supposed to be better, still people. So like one out of 10, assume they're a groomer, assume they're a rapist, assume they're a lot. 
One out of 10, just like a normal society, right? I think that's like pretty, pretty reasonable, you know? the hell why not do it and if they're going to do it anyways you know i can help them and if i help them why not take a piece of the action and the answer is to me the answer to that is well how about because it's ignoble and wrong now you could you could counter and you could say well you're just too useless and timid to dare to do that right and and i'd say you know point taken you know nietzsche had pointed this out back in the 1850s he said most morality is cowardice in the guise of morality. It's not like mm -hmm. it's not like I'm good. It's just that I'm afraid to do that. And that's why they say you. That's why I say you have to know if your values are actually values because you need to be tempted. You won't know if you really have values unless you actually know what temptation is. So one of the things that I noticed in people is they'll say like, "Oh, I have values. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I value. I value things." But when push comes to shove, when there's actually a temptation, they give in. There's no values. Do you guys, going back to Columbine, he mentioned that there was always this rumor in Columbine that I don't think was ever proven that they would go up to people and ask them, like, do you believe in Jesus Christ, right? All the Christians used to say this. My parents used to test us. They'd say, okay, a gunman comes up to you and says, do you believe in Jesus Christ? And they said, are you willing to die for Christ? And I was like, yeah, if I really believe in God, I'm not going to deny him. Like Peter, I'm not going to deny him in that moment. Now, some people would say, well, you're in a survival situation. Like, why would you do that? Why would you die today when you can live another day for Christ? And that's a good question. I think both answers are kind of reasonable. I think it's reasonable to lie in a survival situation and not die. And I think it's also reasonable to die for your values. I can't blame the people who would die for God. And I can't blame the people who would live another day for God. But then you have to ask yourself, what are my values? Am I willing to die for Christ? I wouldn't recommend dying for a fictional man. Well, not that he's fictional, but a fictional God. But, you know, you do you. Tate would say, well, if you're just not doing something because you're a coward, that doesn't mean you're good. And whereas I'm forthright and tough, and look at me, I climb into the ring, and, you know, I can entice women into, you know, sex work online and take a cut, and why the hell shouldn't I? And I think that if you're a timid and reprehensible, resentful, bottom-dwelling male, that that's going to look like an attractive alternative. Mm -hmm. But but it's not the highest form of human behavior, right? It's so I agree with Peterson in this realm. Um, he's a little sex negative for me in general, but I do agree with him that Andrew Tate's model lacks dignity. It lacks real choice. It's manipulative and pimpy and convinces the women that this is the best thing for them, but doesn't really value the women as like equal participants. And we know this because of the influence that his viewers have, the way his viewers often talk about women and the way these men... Obviously, see, they're alpha. There's no alpha women in these groups, right? So there's obviously a us first, them second, and I don't think that's ever dignified. It's not, it's not acceptable. Like, I think pimps of any sort are, I truly believe they're amongst the most contemptible of people. I think there's nothing in, you know, the pimp is, I've got all these hoes and look at me like, you know, king of these women. And it's like, no, you are the ultimate in pathetic, parasitic predator. True. There's nothing about that that's heroic. True. It's just pathetic. True. Now, you might say, if you're that type, well, at least is, I'm not as contemptible as the cowards who hide behind me. It's like, fair enough. You know, there's, there's ranks of order even in hell. And there's lower and higher demons, you know, and... The person who would like to do something terrible but is too cowardly to do it, that's a pretty damn low form of demon. Mm. But that doesn't mean that the person who would like to do something and is courageous enough to do it, even though it's bad, isn't also a demon. Oh, ain't, ain't fucking men, Jordan. Okay, Jordan Peterson. Me and Jordan Peterson agreeing. And I'm not just agreeing with him because I don't like Andrew Tate. This is literally what I would say I agree with full force across the board, right? Just because you're willing to do it and you make it sound cool doesn't mean it is, bro. Okay? And so, you know, I think fundamentally that Tate serves his, his immediate self in this, like, impulsive, gratifying manner. Mm -hmm. And I think that goes along with his, you know, look at me, I'm in a Bugatti. It's like, you know, <laughs> fair enough, man, in some way. Do you think what he's been telling men more on the, you know, take I swear Jordan Peterson base he just needs to stay off Twitter Jordan Peterson needs to he needs to just like I wish I could talk to him and just be like look Jordan 
This is what I feel like is happening. You need to chill. But the problem is, like, I don't think he can. I don't think he can chill. He's too, again, I don't like dealing with people that are like, if I don't do this, the world's going to end. The world doesn't care about you. To have the narcissism to think, like, you are the one who's going to save the world, girl, go to therapy. So this idea, like, this energy I see in people, if we don't do this, the world's going to end. May it end swiftly. May the meteorite hit me straight up, girl. May it burn these curls into heaven, girl. What are you so afraid of dying for when you are so afraid to live? I can't handle people that are so afraid to live and yet so afraid to die. Sir, do not lecture me about the world ending when you are too pussy to live your life. Responsibility for your life. Not that Jordan is too pussy, but bro, sometimes he be pussy. And, and do things. Mm -hmm. If that, I mean, it's hard to, I suppose, separate it from well, everything else. Well, in actual else. life, people are complex. No villain. I think when I say that, I want to be clear. I think he's afraid to face himself, which is like the ultimate thing I don't like. He faces parts of himself, just like Andrew Tate does, but he doesn't go all the way. I don't believe him when he says he's faced his, like his demons. I think he's still in the middle of it, but his, because his battle is so deep and strong, it comes through in his work. And I, I do think he's negatively influencing people and causing more harm than good when he doesn't separate his own demons from everyone else's. And is simple. No, no villain is simple, you know, and, and, and in, in great literature, the great villain is a sympathetic figure. You're kind of on board for 75% of it. And not only that, you, mm -hmm. you might also say, well, if I was in that position, I might do the same thing. Like it's only a cartoon villain who's 100% evil. True. That's why villains are so relatable and good and believable because we are all very close to being villains. It's just you make the decision not to be. Every time you say, I'm not going to be a villain, even though I'm tempted to be, you're showing a sign of character. When you decide not to cheat, even though it's tempting, you're choosing not to be the villain that day. That's pretty great. When you choose not to steal or not to like misuse people or not to maliciously do things, you're choosing not to be the villain that day. But to say that we're without temptation is like outrageous. Of course we have temptation. It's when we choose not to. The villains aren't people who were born villains. They're people who gave in to temptation. You become the villain if you do not have the strength to have values, if you don't have the strength of discipline. Right, and so even when you meet someone who's dark and psychopathic to the core, you'll find, and I've had clients who were like, I had one client who had like five restraining orders out against him. He was actually quite comical. He's quite a young guy, small guy, kind of slight, extremely intense. You know, he had that kind of human shark thing going. And he was actually, he was quite the horrible riotous blast to work with because he was, he was a very interesting monster. And he would, five restraining orders is a lot. Yep. And restraining orders don't work on the sort of people who need restraining orders. So mm. don't be ever thinking a restraining order is going to help you. Not if a real monster's got you in his sights. And he- Well, he okay, whoa. Why do people say this? The restraining order is just to show you've done the work. You don't always get the restraining order because you think it will keep people away. It's so you don't get vi It's so you don't get victim blamed when people are like, why didn't you get a restraining order? Why didn't you do what was needed? We know the restraining order doesn't necessarily keep a monster away. But the monster that is society, the mob that is society that's not going to believe you anyways, that's the first thing they say. Well, why didn't you get a restraining order? Why didn't you do that? We know. You think we don't know, but we live in a society and there are parts of society that won't validate your stalker or your victimhood or whatever, unless you have this paperwork that says I had to get a restraining order. And also people weaponize restraining orders. On the other side of it, people get fake restraining orders or restraining orders for fake reasons. So they can say, oh, see, I got a restraining order, but restraining, bro. I had a paranoid end to him, and what that meant was if he was ever insulted by you, he would blow the insult up and it would put enmity between the two of you. So like talking to him was quite the nightmare because you didn't get to make a mistake and he was hypervigilant because he was paranoid. So he's just watching you like a bloody hawk for every deviation from honesty and like I never lied to him 
And if I thought he was doing something stupid and terrible, I just told him that I, looks to me like that's pretty stupid and terrible. Like there was no, I wasn't playing with him and I wasn't trying to impress him. And I talked to him for a long time, but he would, uh, he would, <laughs> I remember he told me one time about going into a bank, you know, and he met one of those tellers that, you know, you go into an institution sometime, you meet somebody with bureaucratic personality disorder and they decide that the good thing to do that day is to just screw up your life with yeah, some yeah, idiot yeah, complication yeah. just because they can. It's my job. Right, right. Yeah, well, yeah. you know, I have to do this. And they're, they're playing their little power game because they're like Dostoevsky's underground man and they're resentful to the core. And so they're going to just screw around with you. Well, now and then someone would do that with him. And he'd say, I'm going to be your worst nightmare. <laughs> And then what he meant Bro. was, I'm now going to commit a sizable proportion of my life and all my intellectual prowess. Rip. So sad. I know people like this, yeah. To making you as miserable as I can possibly imagine. And then he would go do that. You know, and there was actually... Ooh. This is in, yeah, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Ooh, well, maybe it right. shouldn't be a bureaucratic nightmare. Well, right, <laughs> right. Well, and then see that, well, and that was the weirdly admirable part, right? It's like... You know, because typically what would happen in a situation like that is you'd go into the bank and you'd just swallow it. And then yeah. you'd go out and, you know, go home and kick your dog and bitch at your <laughs> wife because you didn't tell the bureaucrat to, you know, watch the hell out or something terrible is going to happen. Well, he was way on the other end of the distribution. It's like, don't muck with me. And he meant, he was an honor code guy. It's like, <laughs> don't muck with me. And what he meant was, don't muck with me. Now, and he meant it, and there was something admirable about that, you know, even though he was a very dangerous person and he had taken it way too far, but this is what I mean by complexity of the villain. It's like, well, <laughs> he had the courage of his convictions, let's put it that way, you know, and so when you see someone like Andrew Tate, well, first of all, if you have any sense, you think this is a guy that's actually crawled in the ring, mm. and the second thing you think is, well, just because his moral compass is warped and, and warped in a serious way on the like electronic pimp front. And like, I think in a fatal way, personally, that's the highest likelihood because I don't think you can do that without it permeating everything. Yeah. That doesn't mean that, you know, he's a two dimensional villain, you know, or that there aren't things about him that are complex and interesting and potentially even admirable. You know, people are complicated and well, that's the hard part, right? We are complicated and there is nuance. And I think everyone has the right to redemption. And I think everyone has the right to enter back into society to some extent or their bubbles or their families or whatever. I think it's just difficult. Harmony says, what do you think about the whole living in my villain era trend? I think it's a good feeling to be like, I'm just going to be the villain. I'm going to be in my villain era. I think there's something really cathartic about it. But obviously, like, I'm going to encourage people to seek out their joy and to be compassionate and to be thoughtful and to be happy, kind, and healthy. And, like, I'm going to encourage people to be, you know, a lot of things that aren't about being in your villain era. But I think a lot of people cope with the idea of, like, I'm in my villain era to kind of say, I'm going to take control of my life and I'm going to do what's good for me and not for anyone else. And I think there's a part of that that's a really part of growing up. And then there's a part of growing up that says, like, being a villain is silly, right? Even Peterson has that tendency where he's like, fine, you think I'm the bad guy, I'll be the bad guy. And I'm like, Re relax, Nicki Minaj, sit down. It's like there's this gusto, this machismo, this like toxic masculinity that all these people produce where they're like, oh, I'll be the bad guy, you know? But that's the thing. It is tempting to be the bad guy because there's some part of your brain that tells you the bad guy is dominant. The bad guy is a winner. The bad guy somehow does what he wants and there's a freedom in that. There's something about it that appeals to us and I don't blame people for being tempted towards it. I would just argue there's more freedom in being not the villain, but not even the hero. I'm not much of a hero. I'm a real with you. I'm a Slytherin. I ain't no Gryffindor. I just don't think there's much value for most people to be the hero or the villain. I just think there are so many other things you could be that are more valuable. But, you know, that's just me. I don't identify with either the villain nor the hero. I just think both of them are kind of too narcissistic for me, too, like, ego, too main character for me. But I get it. Like, somebody's got to be that, I guess. You know? Like, Farm Brother's a pretty good hero, Gryffindor archetype. Like, he's a pretty good version of it that I don't mind too much. He's very helpful. He's good to his society. But he's mostly his ego. 
he always says like, God is trying to humble me, but it's so hard when you're this good looking and this successful and this, and it's true. It's hard to humble a person who's got one of the best lives, you know, it's hard to humble them, but that's his journey. His journey will be, how do I humble myself when I got the lottery? How do you stay humble in a world where you're like good looking, you have a good job, you have a great wife and a great family, and you have everything you've ever wanted and you're 31. He goes to church daily. He goes to daily mass. He's working on his humility and he'll be working on it until the day he dies. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. But that's the point. It's hard to do it. But when you fit into the villain, same thing. When you really fit into the villain trope, you're really good at being a villain. There's something really rewarding about that, I think, to your brain. There's something so justifiable about it to your brain. I just don't recommend it. I don't think it facilitates your real joy. I, I have yet to see it, at least. And even the villainous types are complicated. And it isn't surprising to me at all that he's an attractive figure, given the current, you know, war against masculinity. He's exactly the same. He's 100% predictable. He's exactly what you'd expect. Would, so, would you talk to him? You know, I pretty much talk to anybody. Oh. I thought about, you know, whether or not that would be a good idea. For me, you know, generally, one of my primary driving forces is just curiosity. Yeah, yeah. Like, and I am a clinician. You know, I like talking to, I've talked to lots of, I've talked to lots of very strange people. You know, lots of them. And it's very interesting to do that because you're really wandering into no man's land. And that's perilous and ridiculously, crazily interesting. That's what I loved about part of what I loved about being a clinician. Like almost everybody is interesting enough to be a Dostoevsky character if you start listening to them. And so just ordinary people, if you listen to them, they're ridiculously weird and interesting. And mm. then you find someone truly weird and interesting and listening to them, listen to them, it's like you can hardly stand it. Mm. Carl Rogers talked about this, you know, he said people won't listen because they're too terrified of changing. Because, you know, if you listen to someone, they tell you how weird they are. You share in that self-revelation. It's well, There's a good and bad to this, right? I, I would like to be known as somebody who's so weird that it makes people pause and think like, does she know something I don't know? Yes, but also no, right? I don't, I don't think I really know anything people don't know. I just know it more than people know it. So I can actually integrate it into my life. And that's why I can have like the life I want, right? So we all know but I just implement it into my life. So I hope people see me and go like, she's weird. Does she know something I don't? Mm. Again, I don't know anything you don't know. I just implement it. I actually do it, right? Now, on the other side of that, there's like these weirdos that even I see and I'm like, like Mr. Girl. I think Mr. Girl is one of those characters where I look at him and I want him to be a person who knows something I don't know so I can be better. But every time I learn about him, I just want to like, I don't feel good. I feel unsafe and I want to crawl into a hole and I feel like he's willing to do things so outside the norm that he'd be willing to hurt people, which he is displayed. He has displayed this with Shaylin, that he is willing to hurt people, including himself, which he's displayed with his own work, to such an extent in which the harm overdoes the good. And I think I've displayed the opposite, which is I am weird and unorthodox, but I hopefully am displaying obviously healthy over harm right and I think that shows in how happy I am and how great things have been like also how healthy I feel and also the 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 work I've been doing right um I think it does show like your ability to play within society shows now not everyone's good at this I think Sneeko Mr. Girl and Peterson all suffer from in a spectrum Peterson's the most reasonable amongst them but still all suffer from a disconnect of how to be reasonable within society. They're almost like the people at the grocery store who stand out to you and you're like, dude, just like act normal in the grocery store. Like everyone knows what that means, but also what does that mean culturally speaking? You kind of know what it means, but it feels like they all forget what that means. It's too interesting. So, and I'm sure talking to Andrew Tate would be too interesting. So. Okay, we should wrap up because you've got to run, but just oh. really quick. Um, you, you set up a donation site for your friend Charles. And okay. God bless Charles. We hope he's doing well. Okay.
was fun Yet all I do is whine Not to you in my mind Cause I know I don't make sense I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool